I am excited uh, today because God, you know, you, you have to be open to the Spirit of God, and, and, and I'm learning that, boy, God's plans are a lot better than mine. Many of you received an email saying that today I would start a brand new teaching series called No Regrets. And in your bulletin, uh, you see the handout. It says No Regrets. But last night when I heard the presentation from Pastor Victor Torres and being sponsored by CLC, um, the Holy Spirit really spoke to me. And after the presentation, I went home and I showed Camille and the kids the, the video that's on Facebook, and we'll post it on our webpage today. Um, I was like, wow, I mean, that's a pretty powerful story. And, and I thought, you know, I'm going to be here next week. People are going to see me next week. But very rarely do we actually have a situation where God literally brings someone to you with a word for you. Like, he just literally brings people. And we talk about 2019, God doing things new. I want us to be open to what God is doing. When you, go, when you get so stuck in a pattern that you know what God's going to do next, that's boring. I don't want to be where God was. I want to be where God is, right? I want to I I be in that. I want to live in that flow. And so you and I, we have to be keen to the Holy Spirit. So what that means is we're going to have to uh, uh, get, get out. We have to deprogram ourselves from some things that we've been taught about God. We really don't know him like we think we do. God's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are, for, are, are higher than our thoughts. When I was young and, and I didn't know anything, when I first got saved, I thought I knew the Lord. I thought I knew God. I knew what God was going to do. And boy, the older I got and life started to happen and I'm sitting there like, Lord, I don't know what you're doing. I'm just going to trust you. Anybody like that? Just, I don't know what you're doing, Lord, but I'm just going to trust you. I'm going to trust you. And, and see, that's what faith is. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. If you can see it, it's not faith. If you can see it, touch it, taste it, it's not faith. Faith is for what you can't see. It's for what you can't touch. It's for what you can't taste. That's what faith is for. So God wants to make us people who walk by faith and not by sight. And if we could ever get that, boy, our life would be changed. So um, after last night, I was like, the Holy Spirit was like, okay, Pastor, you got a word, but there's somebody else that God has sent that has a word for you as well. So um, I, I text uh, Pastor George because, you know, we like to do things together. You know, we're leading together. And so I said, man, I really feel like God is, 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 is I'm sensing that God wants to change the program. He said, look, man, whatever God's saying to you, let's do it. So I texted uh, Rosalinda. Uh, I said, look, um, I believe that uh, Pastor Victor has a word for us today, so uh, we're going to give him some time to do what the Lord wants him to do. So we arranged a little bit, uh, th rearranged some things today. But how many, how many know it's okay when you're flowing with the Holy Spirit? Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. Now, I, I am a pastor, and I'll tell you, one of the things that as a pastor, one of my roles and one of Pastor Victor's roles is, is to protect the flock. We don't let just anybody come up in here. All right? So if anybody that, that we, we allow to stand behind this pulpit, just know that we trust them. Right? If they're not standing behind the pulpit, it's because we don't trust them. <laughs> the elders here, we, we are serious about this thing. You know, because God's going to hold us accountable, right? So I, I want to let you know that God has shifted some things. And... Um, Pastor Victor Torres is going to speak today. So let me tell you a little bit about him. Pastor Victor Torres was once a heroin addict, a drug pusher, and a warlord in one of Brooklyn's toughest gangs, the Roman Lords. He was miraculously converted and delivered from the bondage of addiction through a ministry similar to New Life for Youth. He graduated from Bible College in California where he met his wife, Carmen. In 1971, Victor and Carmen Torres were on a national speaking tour with Richmond, Virginia as their first stop. 
At the time, they didn't realize that Richmond would become their permanent home and a base for their outreach ministry. Realizing it was God's plan to remain in Richmond, they began reaching out on the streets of Richmond, ministering in front of nightclubs and in prisons. The need was apparent, and they started bringing the hurting youth into their own home, allowing them to sleep anywhere they could fit a bed, some even sleeping on the floor. Victor and Carmen were bringing hope and change to broken lives. They founded New Life for Youth and opened the Men's Ranch in Beaver Dam, Virginia, a beautiful 118-acre farm when the need for help outgrew the humble beginnings of the first home. Later, the men's program was joined by the Mercy House, a home for women in Richmond, Virginia, and Mercy Moms for single mothers with children, and New Life Outreach International Church in Richmond, Virginia. Victor Torres continues to reach out to the hurting and inspire change in others through his autobiography, Son of Evil Streets, which has been made into a major motion picture under the title Victor. So I don't have a motion picture about me, but this man does. He was, a, he was out of, I think now I got correct, out of 2,000 entries? 2,000? 2,000 entries. His movie was selected by Heart, at the Heartland Film Festival and was released in 2017. It's in theaters. And it was in theaters, and you can probably find it, but you can also buy it today. We're going to have that movie available today. So, Pastor Victor Torres is a man who is walking the talk. And I thought, after hearing him last night, I said, we need to hear what God has given this man to share with us. So I want us to receive Pastor Victor, and before he comes, his daughter, Rosalinda will share with us. Let's receive her at this time. Thank you so much. It's so great to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. And from last night, God moved in such a powerful way. But being here this morning, you know, I love your logo because you are a true picture of cultures coming together, worshiping Christ and the Lord Jesus Christ is in the center. And I am just so touched by that. It reminds me of our home, um, our home church. Um, I have the privilege of traveling with my dad and going all over the world and just bringing the gospel that transforms lives um, and seeing broken lives being restored. Uh, but when you walk into a church that feels like home, that's a good feeling. Amen. I know you love the Lord this morning. So we're so glad to be here with you. Um, you know, uh, Pastor Jonathan was so gracious to have us here today, and he talked a little bit about those outreaches. Well, I grew up in the home when my mom and dad started taking addicts and prostitutes and broken people right off of the street, and they came into our house. Our house was just a little small house, and, and I always say you could walk in the front door and fall out the back. You know, it was that little, but somehow there was space where these broken people could come, and my brothers and sisters, we gave up our beds and slept on the floor and couldn't always understand what was going on in their life. But when they walked out of there, we knew that God had touched them, had transformed them, and had given them a new direction. Amen. And so um, one of the things I was sharing with Pastor Jonathan, I woke up really early this morning and my kids are back home and, and my husband is back um, during our ministry back there. So I got to sleep in. So I was kind of upset that I woke up really early. But really the Holy Spirit had told me something is today that God is just going to use this uh, service to shift destinies. People that were maybe on the way to hell are going to go to heaven today. Amen. And that's what the gospel of Jesus Christ is all about. Um, with that movie, I got to be a part of that project, and the movie is transforming lives around the world. Uh, we'll be back, we'll be in Canada this weekend on the way to Costa Rica after that, and it is a movie that is such a tool. So if you know anybody, um, not even just with a 
addiction, but searching for hope. You know, it's a hope of a praying mother. Um, that's going to be a great movie. We have that here. My dad's life story is in the book called Victor, and we'd love for you to get a copy of that today. And then his latest book, it hasn't even hit the stores, so we actually have a few of these. It's going to hit the stores on the 8th, and I'm so proud of this project, and it's called Reaching Your Addicted Loved One. And what's so special about this is that it gives us the guidelines, like what do we do if we know somebody is addicted? How do we reach them? How do we help them find the healing that you and I know is Jesus? And so that book is there. And since I hang out with a guy um, all my life, and um, you know I travel with him, I always say, just because he still pays my meals and, and things like that. So it's always good to still travel with daddy. But like father, like son, uh, or like father, like daughter, um, well, he's got a son too. I wrote a book, it's called Dare to Begin Again. So if you happen to be stuck in life, if you're not where you think you should be, um, there's steps in this, true life stories of how people, um, women took those steps to allow Christ to pull, pull them out of that situation and put them into a new life. Thanks so much for having us. We're so excited to be here with you today. Amen. Amen. Well, you know, today we house uh, uh, over a hundred people in the homes that, that we operate uh, that are there uh, receiving healing, transformation through the power of Jesus Christ. You know, we're not into rehabilitation. We are into transformation. We believe in transformation. We believe that it's the power of God that changes people's lives. But uh, we are just so thankful to be here this morning. I want to thank Pastor Jonathan, you know, for allowing the Holy Spirit to speak to you. Uh, I, you know, I, I didn't know that that was going to happen, but... But, you know, walking with God, as you know, you have to be open. And, and uh, so in the back of, of my mind, somewhere there, the Holy Spirit uh, always uh, keeps us uh, ready. Amen. In season and out of season <clears throat> to do what he wants to do through us. And, and this is a very special time in which we are living today. We're living in a very prime time this is prime time but also we are in a spiritual warfare and we know that the devil is mad at the church and he is mad at men and women that honor God and are doing his work and especially you know my wife had a, a vision one day uh, as we were having graduation and uh, <clears throat> and also a celebration of the miracles the lives that have been changed and uh, and when she saw, you, you know, I mean, we, we, we had about 200 there that night, uh, students, men and women, going through our program. And uh, the Lord just showed her that she, 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 God took her to hell. And, and, and the Holy Spirit showed her a hole in hell. hell how many know that hell is a hole? Yeah. Right? But she showed her a hole in hell. And she said, you have created that hole. Because of all those lives that should have been there. But today they're saved. And they're serving God. And that, you know, just brings it home to know that, that you are doing God's work. And, and this is what we do. Uh, we've been doing it for several years. If you ask why Richmond, Virginia, you have to talk to God about that one. <clears throat> because, uh, you know, we had no idea that that was going to be a home uh, when we got to Richmond. It was a different city. Today we've seen some great changes. But it was a total different city, the capital of the Confederacy, and um, a, a, a lot of division, uh, especially in the churches. But thank God the walls are coming down. Amen. <laughs> the walls are coming down. And we're seeing a move of the Holy Spirit. God has used our ministry there in a very powerful way. Uh, and so, you know, we know that, that God is at work. And as we enter a, a new year, I think it's important to be uh, conscious of that and to allow the Holy Spirit to create a consciousness in us of his presence and, and his will and what he wants to do in our lives for this coming year. So I want to take you to a scripture that the Holy Spirit 
uh, put in my heart. A couple of weeks ago, God gave me this word, and I've seen this word before, this passage, and I preach from it so many times, but, but it just popped out so powerfully. And I believe it's, it's a word for this church. The fact that I'm here, the fact that I am ministering this morning, not of our doing, but, but the Holy Spirit. I, I want to share this word with you. It's Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 2 and 3. And here's what the word of God says. Thus says the Lord who made it. Thus says the Lord who made it. The Lord who formed it, who established it, the Lord is himself. Call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things. Everybody say things. Great. Mighty things which you do not know. Which you do not know. And, you know, part of my testimony <clears throat> is, is this passage of scripture that's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, verse 9, which says, But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. How many love God here this morning? Amen. Father, we just thank you for your word. And I pray, Lord, that you will move mightily in every heart. This morning, stir us, Holy Spirit. Speak to us in a powerful way. Transform our lives and open our eyes, O oh God, our spiritual eyes, that we may see what you have made for us. This coming year, O oh God, that we will believe you for great and mighty things, Lord, in our lives uh, and in our witness for you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. If anybody would have stopped me uh, several years ago when, when I was uh, on the streets, uh, of New York, uh, growing up in Brooklyn, I grew up in a place called Brownsville, uh, Brooklyn, uh, East New York. And uh, if you know anything about Brownsville, it has a terrible reputation even throughout the years. Uh, uh, beyond modern days, you know, it was, it was uh, an area for the mafia and uh, Murder Incorporated. We lived across the street from Murder Incorporated, if you can believe that. As a child, you know, I used to wash the cars of these guys, you know, and shine their shoes. And, and it, was, it was a real uh, heavy-duty neighborhood. And then, of course, came the, the gangs. Uh, the, the gang that I was with, the Roman lords and uh, dragons and uh, hell burners and Frenchmen, you know, just like we have today, these gangs uh, that control the environment, that control uh, entire cities. Uh, and then the drugs came in. And then that complicated things, the crack houses uh, uh, came and uh, all kinds of things that, that uh, started to happen in this neighborhood. Well, at the age of 12, by the age of 12, I was already in trouble with the police. I had stabbed another young man. I was carrying uh, a, a knife with me. I was part of a little gang running in the streets looking for identity and protection. And, and I went crazy. I just went totally crazy. And my parents, of course, were, were, were I mean, feeling terrible because they had come from Puerto Rico uh, to New York like many families come to America looking for the American dream. And that dream now, real fast, is turning into a nightmare. And they don't know what to do. At age 12, I'm already going to jail. By the age of 14, I, I picked up a, a needle and I, and, I, and I took a shot of heroin. By the age of 18, I've been incarcerated now three times. Uh, I've been in and out of hospitals. I'm a drug addict. I'm pushing uh, a dope on the streets. I'm running around with this gang. I own three guns, a rifle and two guns, and, and just doing crazy, terrible things. So if anybody would have stopped me during that time and would have said to me, Victor, one day you're going to be a preacher. Or you're gonna, they're going to make a movie out of you, and you're going to be in Hollywood, and uh, you're going to travel to over 40 countries around the world preaching the gospel. I would have said, man, tell me what kind of dope you're taking. Because I like to get a hold of that. You know, that would have been it's just crazy to think something like that. 
But that is why the word of God says, eyes have not seen, nor ear heard. Nor enter into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them who love me. You know, I would have never, uh, I would have never imagined, never imagined that one day I was going to be doing what I'm doing today. Just like every one of us, God has created things. God has made things. And it's not just any old thing. Because when the prophet Jeremiah brings this word, he's not talking about uh, man-made things. You know, we all come across some good things and things that affect our lives and they, they even affect our future. Uh, but, but, you know, it's the material things, it's the things uh, of this world, uh, the, the tangible things, and, 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 and a lot of them are, are good things. But here, the Spirit of God is taking us to heaven. And the Spirit of God is saying God has created things, but they are God kind of things. These, these are things that are made by God, created by God for them who love him. For them who know God. For them that come to the saving grace uh, of Jesus Christ. So right there in 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 2 verse 10 and 12. The scriptures say. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searcheth all things. Uh, yes the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man. Except the spirit of the man which is in him. Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Now, we have received not the Spirit of the world. Can I get an amen? amen? But the Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. And it's very important that we notice these things when they come to us. Because that's the way God moves in the church. That's the way God wants to move in your life in this coming year. In this coming year, you know, I, I, I want to believe uh, that God is going to do marvelous things in my life. Uh, and things that are going to take me beyond my natural circumstances. I don't know about you, but I want to see God do great and mighty things in my life. Amen. And I want to see it in the church. I want to see it in the lives uh, of God's people. So this morning, there are some things. Number one, uh, you know, to be connected to the Word of God. To be connected to the Word of God. Uh, more than ever before. You're going to have 365 days this year. You're, you're going to have 8,760 hours to contend with. And what are you going to do with that time? What are you going to, I think that if there's something that is important for the body of Christ for this coming year for the church uh, is to really stand on the word of God Amen. and to really preach the gospel. You know, I've never known in my time, in my lifetime, a generation that needs the gospel more than this generation. Amen. That needs the word of God. You need the word of God. I need the word of God. Amen. And, you know, we live in a time where God's people are not even reading the Bible. The only, the only Bible we get is when we come to church and Pastor Jonathan uh, preaches it, right? Oh, I preach it in our church. And, and many Christians, you know, don't read the, they don't even know how many books are in the Bible. They can't even explain their salvation uh, based on the Word of God because they don't know the Word. And it's so important that the Word of God becomes an integrate part of our lives. Uh, I think that if, if there's one thing that God wants us to experience this coming year is the power of the Word. The power of the Gospel working in us. And so we need to, to do the best we can to create a consciousness, uh, not only of the presence of God, but also of the reality of the Gospel. The reality of the word of God. Proverbs chapter 3 verses 1 through verse 6. Solomon brings us five things 
that I believe be great to adopt every one of us for this coming year. Notice what it says. My son, do not forget my law, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace they will add to you. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. And so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. How many know that's important? Verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. So I want you to notice this. You know, because the, the, the first thing that Solomon brings out here is that we stay in the word. That we build upon the word of God. That we built upon the word of God. And that's because the word of God is God's word. God's spoken word. God inspired word. It's creative. You know, I, I, you know, we need to love the word of God. Because that's the one thing that God has given us. If God's going to speak to you this year, he's going to do it through his word. And he's going to use his word. You know, we use the Bible in the type of ministry that we run. Uh, we, we use the Bible. It's, it's our curriculum. I remember a certain time a judge came to visit us. And uh, he came to visit our organization, our ministry, he, he really didn't know it was a ministry. All he knew was that this was, we were running a rehab program. And mo most judges today, they look for places where they can send uh, the people that come before the bench, especially the young man or young woman that are on drugs and they, they know that they need rehabilitation. They would rather send them to one of these places. So for several years, he was sending us guys and girls to our program. But then he got curious. One day he said, huh, it's really strange that uh, I don't see some of the people that I'm sending to this particular organization, I don't see them before my bench again. And, and I'm wondering why. It's a true story. And so he decided to come and visit our center, our home. And one day, you know, he popped in, didn't even make an appointment. He just popped in. I happened to be in the office that day. And we welcomed him in. And he started asking questions. And he says, listen, what, what is it that you guys use? What, what, what's, what's your program? And I said, well, Your Honor, with, with all due respect, I went to my office. I got my Bible. And then I put our curriculum inside of the Bible. And I brought it to him. And I put my Bible in his hands. And he looked at me and says, what is this? I said, that's what we use. We use the word of God. We use the Bible. He says, you mean to tell me that this is what you use on these men and these women? I said, that's right. And it works. It changes lives. Amen. How many know the word of God works? It works. And so, you know, the Bible is not only a book to be kept at home, but it is God's way God's word to speak to our lives uh, and to bring edification and to bring healing into our lives. So this year we need, I want to encourage you to read your Bible more than ever before. Just don't read it. Pray that the Holy Spirit will speak to you through it because it is a faith builder. Amen. It is a thing that's going to build your faith, strong faith, uh, for this coming year. And then make sure that you do not allow the enemy to harden your heart. Yeah, amen. To harden your heart. But stay, stay sensitive, forgiving, and compassionate. And that is one of the characteristics that the body of Christ needs to have in the kind of world that we live today. Because we live in a world where there's so much hate. There is so, so much division. And even in churches, there's so much division. You know, when we got to Richmond, I mean, you know, we came to the capital of, of the Confederacy. I didn't know that. I grew up in New York. I grew up in Brooklyn, you know, and I didn't know that churches were so segregated like that. And, and I mean, it was like you could cut it with a knife. 
And here comes this Puerto Rican from New York, you know, didn't know anything. And I married a, a girl born and raised in Mexico, and she couldn't even speak English. You know, how many know that God chooses the foolish things of this world to confound, find the wise? I mean, we didn't know what we were doing, you know, but, but thank God we didn't know what we were doing. Because we would have messed it up. We would have messed the whole thing up and God began to use us in rich. And I started preaching in black churches and white churches. And, and I started speaking in, in high schools. And uh, I mean, people started to invite us to minister to them. And we were like a, 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 just a, a fresh air that had come to Richmond. And on top of that, we opened up a home to hurting people. But I had never seen so much division and so much hate. But that is why it's so important that as the body of Christ, uh, that we allow the Holy Spirit to keep us sensitive to people's needs uh, and the love of God to flow through us, amen, and God's mercy and God's compassion that we may be able to touch people. Listen, people ought to be able to touch you and embrace you no matter where they come from. And that's one thing, you know, that people that hurt, like I've done many, many prisons and preached in prisons all around the world. And we were just in Colombia, in, in uh, uh, a city called Bucaramanga, uh, Colombia. It sounds like I'm speaking in tongues because I never heard that word. I couldn't even pronounce it when I got there. Bucaramanga, you know, but uh, God opened the doors. Before we left that city, over 8,000 people came to Christ. Over 8,000 people. I mean, we were walking into prisons and, and before we even start speaking, and I, I'm telling you, we got pictures to prove this. We, we walked into one prison where it looked like Pirates of the Caribbean uh, Alcatraz and Sin Sin put together. Uh, and it was terrible. It, it, you know, three floors and, and <clears throat> prisoners wall to wall. Uh, I mean, it, it was just terrible. The, 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 the air, you could cut it with a knife. But even before we started speaking, we began to see these guys, these men, hardened cartel men standing there with tattoos from their head to their toes and just weeping like little babies because of the Spirit of God, because of the Holy Spirit. And this is a privilege and a blessing that we have. Let me have that water. She's got water. Open it for me, please. Thank you. Hallelujah. Here's a third one. Tell the truth. This year, tell the truth. Uh, I think one brother said something about that this morning, but don't lie. God's people don't have to lie to prove anything. We don't have to lie. We don't have to exaggerate or tell half truths. But be truthful this year. Don't hold back the truth. And, you, you know, don't hold back what, what you know is truth in your life. What Jesus has done in your life. I always say truth does not need defense. Yeah. Amen. Because Jesus said it. You will know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And let me tell you something. The world wants to hear the truth. You want to know what young people are looking for today? You want to know what millennials are looking for today? They're looking for the truth. And another thing, they're looking for experience. They're looking to encounter God in their lives. And the church has been called to proclaim the truth. And how, how many know the truth is the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Number four, trust in God. Don't depend on your own understanding to work things out. You know, don't allow your mind and your feelings to deceive you. 
But learn how to trust in God because he is your provider. He will make a way where there is no way. Amen. Hallelujah. He will turn deserts into fountains. If you let him do it, if you give him the freedom in your life, he will make a way for you and he will open great and mighty doors for your life. You know, our ministry is a ministry of faith. It's a, we have to trust God. We have to trust God for every piece of bread. We don't get a check from the government. We don't get federal funding or anything like that. We, you know, we have to pray in every dime. And, and this girl right here, my daughter, thank God, God put that calling in her life. Uh, she's the executive director now of our organization. She's, she's got to pray it in. And it's not easy sometimes. But here's where God's faithfulness comes in. We can trust the man or we can trust God. You know, at one point, and I've got to share this with you, we were going through something very hard, something very difficult. And we started praying. We just started praying, Lord, uh, even to the point that uh, we thought we would have to close some of the houses because money wasn't coming in. And, and, and it was when the money doesn't come in, we can't buy the food and, and uh, we can't pay, uh, run the buildings and, uh, and keep the lights going. So what do we do? We get on our knees. What do you do when you face a challenge in your life? As a believer, you know that my God shall supply. And so you pray and you put your trust in God. And that's what we did. We just trusted God and and during that, that time, that trial, I never had anything like this happen to me before, but uh, as we were praying, I got a, a, a letter, a small envelope with a check inside and a, and, a, and a small note. And the small note wrote, fill out the amount. So I looked at the check and it was a signed check, but it was blank. How many of you ever received a blank check? I never received a blank. So I thought it was a hoax. I thought. Yeah, they're pulling my leg here. This guy, you know, is messing around with my head. And so, but I read the little note over and over again, you know, and, uh, and he said, uh, you know, just fill, fill in the amount. The check is signed, whatever you need. Somehow this guy had heard that we were going through this trial. He was in a hospital laying with, with his, uh, I mean, on his back. He couldn't even move. And he heard about our need. And he, what he, he, later on, he told me that what was happening was that he heard that we were praying and he believed in the power of prayer. And so he said, he was for real. I, I got so nervous, I carried the check for two weeks. <laughs> I was nervous. You know, and, and should I or shouldn't I? Should I, should I, you know, cash it or put in the amount? And we're talking about several thousand dollars. We, we started out with about 14,000 by the time, you know, this whole ordeal, it was almost $30,000 and growing. And I said, boy, I don't know. I, I don't know if I should fill it out, you know. I, and, and so I got a call from him. And he says, what are you waiting for? <laughs> How many know that that's God, right? He'll call you up. He said, what are you waiting for to trust me? And he says, I want you to know the money is in the bank. Go ahead and fill it out. And I said, well, you know, the bills have amounted to more than what, what you, you know, maybe you thought it was. And he says, I don't care what it is. Fill out the amount. The money is in the bank. And hallelujah, we filled out the amount, paid all the bills to the glory of God. Oh, how many know we serve a mighty and great God? Hallelujah. Things. And we're talking about godly things. Anything that is connected to God. See? Then number five, include God in all your plans. Put God first. Lean not on your own understanding. And what is the promise? that he will lead you in all of your ways. He will lead you in the path. And then, of course, you know, we have to live the spirit-filled life. The spirit-filled life is all part of those things that God has created and has made for us. And one of those things is prayer. Prayer. 
that this year we we make it we 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 make it part of our lives uh, you know part of our everyday living that we pray that we seek God not only to to be asking him for things but just simply praying Praying that we get closer to him. Praying that God will move mightily in the church. Listen, God has prepared things for this church. Let me tell you what you guys have done and what you are doing and your witness in this community. I want you to know God has already made the, the victory. He's already given you the breakthrough. He's just waiting for you to walk in it. You know, I, in my house, God didn't live. We didn't have God in our lives. My father was a good man. He was a good husband. He was a good father. My mother was a good mother. Both of them worked hard. They never got separated through all this ordeal. They stuck it out together, but they were just good people, and that was it. They didn't go to church. And here my mother is suffering all this time because her son is a drug addict. He has overdosed. I mean, my mother broke the, the bathroom door on one of the occasions where I overdosed uh, to save me. To save me. Because she knew that I was in there and that I was not coming out. And she didn't know exactly what was happening. But I had OD. When I OD, I was sitting on a chip. But when I OD, I went back and I, I hit the radiator, uh, the, the, the radiator, which is made out of iron, pure iron. When my head hit it, I, I passed out. And I could have I died. I could have I could have just gone into an eternal sleep. And my mother went in there and saved me. She got to the point she didn't know what to do. I, I, I mean, I, I can remember, you know, people telling my mother that, that I was going to end up in the electric chair. All of my friends were dying. 95% of my friends, they all died terrible. The guy that initiated me into the gang was stabbed 22 times right in front of us, right in front of our home. Dying in prison and all kinds of tragedies. And my mother was just going crazy. My father was going crazy. He was so embarrassed in the community because everybody know, knew that his son was doing crazy stuff on the streets. But then one day my mother heard about a little church that had opened up in the neighborhood about a mile from where we live. And my mother didn't drive. She didn't own a car. She had to walk and my father the same way. But she heard about this church and the, the name of the church was John 3.16. Just like that, just like the, it wasn't, you know, spelled out. It, it was the quote of the Bible, John 3:16 church. And she heard about that church and she went there for the first time. And there she found Christ. She found Jesus. She had a wonderful encounter with God. And her own life was changed and transformed. And not only did she bring Jesus to our home, to our little apartment, but she also brought, I say, you know, my mother was this, this tall, but she brought a giant of a faith with her. And she brought it to the house. And she brought the power of prayer. And she went on a journey of prayer. And she started also bringing these other crazy women from the church. And they would get together and they would pray. And, and they were always, you know, carrying a little bottle of oil with them, you know, anointed everything, the walls, the closet, the, the clothing, my shoes, you name it. At one point, she anointed a handkerchief. She gave it to me. She said, carry this. And I was like, what? You know, I didn't know anything about God. I wasn't raised in a Sunday school situation or church. I was hard on the inside. Sometimes I walk inside of my home, 3 o'clock in the morning, and all the lights would be out. And the only voice that I would hear, the only voice was the voice of, of my mother who was praying in a closet, a small closet that wasn't a walk-in closet. It was one of these little closets with shells. And she would walk in backwards and get into that closet and then close herself in tight. And she would lean between the shells and the door. And there for hours she would pray and intercede. And I didn't understand a lot of this, but I, I would hear her and I would, I would put my ear to the door and, and she would be praying, God, save my son. 
have mercy on my son. Please, God, have mercy on Victor. And then I would hear stuff like, God, make him a preacher. Make him a preacher. And I, I would just go crazy. I would be under the influence of drugs, high as a kite, confused, blind, skinny as can be, dying. And I would open the door maliciously. I would open the door and she would fall on the floor and I would curse her and I would say, mom, you're crazy. Stop this stuff. Stop your religious stuff. But my mother would stand up to me and she would just look at me with this boldness. And she would say, son, I don't care what you believe. And I don't care what the world says. I know that one day God is going to answer my prayer. And you're not going to be a drug addict anymore. You're going to change your life. Your life will change. And I would just walk out of the house mad and crazy. But you know, the more she prayed, God was already in the making. Amen. See, because we can't see what God is doing. But as she prayed, God was calling a man by the name of David Wilkerson, the one that wrote the cross and the switchblade. And God was calling that man from the hills, the hills of Pennsylvania to come to the city and preach to these boys. And she didn't know him and he didn't know her. But God was already in the making. God was making a way. The answer is coming. Amen. I want you to know the answer is coming. And sure enough, David Wilkinson came to the city. He was preaching in my neighborhood and other neighborhoods. And, and uh, then one day she saw that she heard that he had opened this home up. And, and so she started talking to me about this, this place. And she didn't want to tell me that it was a, a, a Christian place because she knew she would turn me off. And uh, all she would say is, hey, son, there is this place. Uh, this man opened up this place and it's going to help you. You need to go there. And I had already tried hospitals and, and I, I, you know, I've been to a couple of hospitals, a metropolitan hospital. By the way, I was one of the first drug addicts to go on the methadone program. So I became a guinea pig, to, guinea pig together with some other drug addicts. Very first, the, when, when the methadone program came to New York City, which was adopted from England, and uh, they put us on this drug thinking that they were going to find a cure. But all they were doing was changing a, a dollar into four quarters because you were still a drug addict when you walked down. It's still the same thing. You use methadone, you're still a drug addict. You're still hooked because if it's controlling your life, you're addicted. And, and, and so that, that's all that was happening. But my mother didn't want to tell me that it was a, a Christian place. But then, then it happened when I went to the home, I went to the center, and when I got there, I was at the end of my rope, completely wasted. And I remember that day when I walked in and I saw these guys with Bibles in their hands, I knew I was fried. I, I knew my mother had tricked me, and they started talking to me about Jesus and what Jesus could do. And, and so I, I gave it a try that day, give it a try. I started withdrawing from drugs, cold turkey, because they told me there, there's no methadone here. There, we're not even going to give you an aspirin. Uh, we're going to give you prayer. And I said, oh, brother. How's that going to help me? Well, when you're high, under the influence, it's okay. You go along with the show. But that night, I got sick. And I started to crave for my fix. Started to crave for heroin. And that night, I couldn't sleep at all. Just, just think about this. For 72 hours, three days, three nights and three days, I was pacing the floor with a blanket over my body, shaking, shivering, throwing uh, up, and with a terrible pain in my stomach. Every fiber of my body, every bone was hurting. And all this time, I didn't know why I was there because there were no bars in the building. And by the third day, you know, I got, I got sick and tired. I mean, one time uh, they came over and they, they poured a whole bottle of oil over my head. They were praying for me. And I said, you guys are crazy. This is not for me. I'm sick. I need a fix. On that day when I decided to leave, there was a blizzard going on. I, I, I 
put my, my, my coat, and, and as I was going to walk out the door, this young man stopped me. He said, Victor, you've tried so many things. Why don't you give God an opportunity to work a miracle in your life? I said, you crazy, man. I'm sick. This is not, this is not for me. This is not going to work. But then suddenly he left me. And when I was there alone, I started thinking about everything that my mother would preach to me and what David Wilkerson would preach and Nikki Cruz uh, would preach to me. And I, I would, you know, think about those things. Uh, I walked back into the building. And when I walked back into the building, I, I did something I'd never done before. I went inside of the little chapel they had there and I just simply got on my knees. I just simply went down to my knees and I asked God and I said, God, if it's true what these people are preaching, that you can give me a new mind, that you can change my ways. I don't want to die as a drug addict on the street. God, help me. And the more I asked God to help me, suddenly something began to happen inside of my heart that I had never experienced before. And I want to tell you that I didn't see lightning. I didn't see the walls come down or ceiling came down. But I knew without a shadow of a doubt that the more I would pray, God began to move inside of me. And when I got up on my feet, I just knew that I had found Jesus Christ. I had found God. And my life changed 100%. Somebody asked me one day, have you been back since then? I said, let me tell you something. God is so good. Haven't dipped, haven't dabbed, haven't touched it one single time. Amen. How many know we serve a good heavenly father? See, that's the thing that God makes. One of the greatest things that God gives us is our salvation. It's when we come to Christ, when we come to Jesus, and we experience him. And from that moment on, my life changed completely. I was able to go to Bible college. Uh, in those days, I don't know if some of you are old enough to remember a lady by the name of Catherine Kuhlman. Well, she paid my schooling. She sent me to school. And I was able to go to school. And there I met a wonderful, I met a wonderful young lady uh, we married and today we have four children 11 grandchildren two great grandchildren amen w wonderful family see i'm sharing all this with you because we're talking about the things that god makes not man but the things that god has created the things that have that god have made everything that's related to god that's related to his word. But number one, the gift of eternal life. Can't buy that. And today, you know, there are a lot of people that are in church that have never really, never really experienced the gift of eternal life. The gift of salvation. See, I believe that God happens to us. When we talk about salvation, it's not something that we adopt. It's not something we learn as we go along the way. Because we can be members of a church for years. I remember preaching at a church uh, uh, down in Virginia. And uh, there was a deacon who came for. I didn't know he was a deacon. But he was an elderly man. And he came with tears in his eyes. He came uh, as a result of the altar call. And he told me. He says, you know, I've been a deacon for, a deacon for 30 years. But tonight, I believe that for the first time in my life, I got saved. Christ came into my life. And he was just part of the show. Part of the religiosity that we have in our churches. But it's so important that we experience God for ourselves. That's what we pass on to our children. Amen. If we're going to pass on anything to our children. And if there's anything that's going to save this generation. It's going to be the gospel of Jesus Christ. The power of salvation. Amen. When we surrender our lives to Jesus. That's the greatest miracle that you can ever possess in your life. I want you to stand with me please. I believe that God is in this place this morning. The presence of God is here. And I don't know where you stand with God, even as we face this new year.